Hello. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Aphrodite, where are you zooming in from? I am zooming in from Virginia and uh, I am a, a, a pianist and piano teacher and uh, we have met uh, Dr. Santa Ana. Do you remember me? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Hi. I judged you in a competition, right? What? Yes, you judged in the competition that an NVMDA was organizing. Exactly. Yeah, I remember now. Right. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We also have Mariah Sam, who teaches in my studio. She's zooming in from Utah, Great. and she is a piano major about to graduate from Brigham Young University. Oh, yes. And let's, yes. And let's see who else is here. Um, I thought I saw Adam here. Adam, do you want to turn off your turn on your oh? So you're just gonna listen, no problems. Where are you zooming in from, Adam? Oh, that's right. It's good to see you. I think he's zooming in from California, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow. There you go. Thanks for joining us, Adam. That's excellent. So you know. <laughs> We might have people coming on in, but I just, first of all, wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Um, Dr. Santana, Jose, is, yes. just accepted a position at uh, as associate professor at Hart School of Music in Connecticut. It's amazing. He continues to be at New York University as an artist faculty. We are really gonna miss him in DC where he was at we'll Catholic University. I'll come I'll and Levine, back. oh my gosh, like it's just so sad. <laughs> but um, I'll be around. Jose, Jose yeah. had, went to Juilliard um, and won many competitions. He's performed with orchestras nationally. He has started uh, the Puerto Rico Music Festival. He has um, such a wide breadth of experience and performs such so beautifully and this repertoire. <laughs> Um, and so we're just really excited that you could share this with us today, Jose, and That's great. Um, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Welcome, everybody. It's a great honor and privilege to be sharing with you all of this. And so I'm very excited. Um, I want, I, of course, to talk about this topic is enormous, but I want to, I just sort of did a few weeks ago, a survey um, in Korea about Spanish music in general. Uh, and I jot down a few notes that I think they're important to share with you uh, because uh, you, once we get into the more of the composer, and of course, uh, uh, Latin American music is totally another animal. <laughs> it has nothing to do because all the influences that has happened in this part of the world. But, you know, the music in Spain has a very long history. Um, it has played an important role, really, even though we're not aware of it, in the Western music uh, in general, uh, since the 15th century. And of course, the uh, Latin American music. Now, when we think of Spain, we, we think always of the tradition of flamenco, the classical guitar, and this is actually uh, the most projected, the most famous uh, music that we know. But Spain has many, is a big country, has many regions, and each region has their own kind of music. For example, um, the music from the north or the northwest mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of influence from the bagpipes, from the Celtic. Uh, the British Isles, um, and uh, so all that north part, even the Basque country, oh, well, the Basque country is another country. It's, it's like being in a different uh, country altogether. So that has their own music, which I'll demonstrate later. And um, then the Jota from Aragon, the other northern part of Spain, uh, is the traditional dance, but the Jota became very popular, not only in that region, so it spilled down. So you'll see many, even flamenco Jotas kind of fusions, you know, and uh, and 
with flamenco, but then there's a part that is a jota, but it's, it's a seguidilla, it's a, uh, what do you call it, uh, the other one, fandango, fandanguillo, jota, so they sort of in interchange. Uh, but of course, the Celtic, the bagpipes, that's totally uh, autochthonous of that region, and also of Catalonia, the music from there also has a totally different flavor. It's music which is very simple. It has kind of a declamatory style. It's usually in binary form, in 2-4, or compound binary form, 6-8. And, um, and it's usually in minor keys. I, I don't know why, but uh, it's, it's a, a way of, it's a little bit like Israeli music in that sense. Um, so then also, you know, uh, in, we're talking in terms of what the piano, but in other, in the broader science, for example, in the vocal sense, uh, impact a great deal, uh, for example, La Zarzuela. Zarzuela is like a little opera, but with spoken words. Well, this is the operetta from Vienna. So who came first, the operetta from Vienna or the Zarzuela? So they sort of interchange. And we have it here in the United States as Broadway. You have music and you have talk. All of that came from this uh, uh, origins of Zarzuela in Spain. Um, now, at, it, Spain went through a period because of political problems and the monarchy, especially in the late 18th century. Um, that the music declined a great deal. Just be before that, they had to even import musicians like Domenico Scarlatti, who had an apprenticeship with the monarchy, the royal family in, in Spain for a few years, and Boccherini also. So they brought it from Italy. And, um, but then when Mozart, Beethoven, that era, Spain started to decline. There was one little uh, guy named uh, Juan Arriaga, the Arriaga, who was a child prodigy. He was called the Mozart, the Spanish Mozart, but he died when he was 21. So he wrote a wonderful quartet, but nothing for the harpsichord or anything like that. Then in the Romantic era, Spain just shut doors musically. Uh, Chopin list at that time, they had, I mean, they had music, folkloric music, and for example, Liszt, you know, wrote the Spanish Rhapsody, uh, which is, by the way, uh, that's also a Jota from Aragon. So, um, and it wasn't until the later part of the century with the advent of Tchaikovsky, the Dvorak, the nationalistic composers, that Spain began to sort of catch up with that. Um, there was an important uh, pivotal um, man named Felipe Pedrel, who was, I guess, what we call nowadays an ethnomusicology. And he just sort of compiled all these rhythms and, and, the, and the flamenco and the Andalusian and he started writing music and teaching young composers on this style. And they said, you know, let's exploit this culture, the folkloric culture we have. So two of the greatest, um, um, or actually three, but uh, uh, pupils that Pedrel has was Isaac Albanis, uh, Enrique Granados, and Manuel de Falla. Manuel de Falla is the youngest of them all, so he was a, he didn't uh, study with Pedrel so much, but especially Granados and Albenis really soaked this. And the advantage was that Pedrel was a local composer, but for example, especially Albenis traveled to a lot. He was every few years he moved. He was in London. He was in Paris. In Paris, he taught at La Scuola Cantorum. He met people like Gabriel Fauré. He met people like uh, Debussy. 
the early impressionistic music and that had a kind of broadening in his uh, writing because he mixed this beautiful uh, impressionistic and late romantic writing with the folkloric elements of Spain. So was the Granados. Granados also brought this um, kind of European fusion with uh, the Chopin style, Liszt style, with Spanish folklore. And um, both of them were great improvisers. Uh, and especially Granados, uh, really, his music was mostly improvised. And he had, after he improvised, he wrote it down to make sure he didn't forget. But it, that was the way they, they, they composed. Um, now, Albanis uh, probably is the one that we're going to talk about most today. Um, he was born in uh, Camprodon, which is a little town north of Barcelona. Uh, and uh, he, I think it's 1868, um, he was a child prodigy. Uh, there are many myths about him. He, he liked to, he, he wrote of himself. He was his own paparazzi. And he all wrote all these fantastic stories about who he was when he was a child. Well, we know that they weren't quite right. I mean, he kind of elaborated on what happened. He was the son of a costume uh, guy, who a uh, costume agent that used to go many uh, places throughout Europe and the Americas you know, in the mercantile uh, Nordic uh, business. So he took him with him. Uh, and he also exploited him because the child, he and his sisters were very, very precocious. So Albanis not only played when he was a child all throughout Europe, but he played in the Americas. He played in New York. He played in uh, Louisiana, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, in uh, Argentina. And um, then, he went to study the, the Queen uh, Victoria gave him a scholarship to go to the Leipzig Conservatory. He studied there with Reinecke composition. He also studied at the Conservatory of Brussels. So he got the usual traditional European training and um, he wanted to study with Franz Liszt, who was you know the greatest uh, teacher pianist of that part in that time and um, not being able to communicate effectively, like nowadays, you're going to be where? At four o'clock, I'll meet you in the station. No, this didn't happen. He went to Budapest thinking that Liz was there. Liz just moved to Weimar a week before. So they weren't able to, but they corresponded and, and they at least got to know each other that way. Um, then Albanis was the type of, uh, uh, he married young, he had a, a, a wonderful family, um, and he went for the theater. So in London, he met this millionaire who gave him money to write music to librettos, like Broadway shows. So he did that. Uh, and then he started suffering from kidneys problems, like kidney stones and things like that. At that time, that was very, unusual and uh, people didn't know how to treat it. So he went back to Spain and from there on he went to Paris and he, he stayed in Paris and he taught there, he wrote uh, a lot of music and of course his greatest uh, masterpiece is the Iberia suite. When the writing for the theaters, the lyrics didn't sort of pan out, then he says I'm going to go back to the piano. Um, but uh, before you tackle a masterpiece and such an enormous work like the Iberia, so that's God, he wrote a lot of pieces that can be used and has that grain that you find in the great works of the Iberia, you find it in very simple pieces. For example, he has several suites, Cantos de España, uh, Chants of Spain, Opus 232, uh, he has another one called Espana, Opus 165. Then he has another one called 
recuerdos de un viaje. And then he also has a sweet Espanol. And all of these are pieces that they range from uh, uh, advanced intermediate to advanced. So it would be a wonderful um, starting point to understand this, this language. Um, and the, the, the important thing, the, these pieces are always, the interesting thing is they start on the major, the A section, the B section is in minor, and then go back to the major, or the A section in minor, the B section in major, and then went back to the minor. So they alternate like that. And some of them have, uh, as you hear, the modal quality, because of course, Spain had Jewish, had Arabic, all this uh, ethnicities that, that make up what the peninsula was. So all in that music is filtered, it's a fusion. Um, I have an example here of one of his, let's see. All right, so from the Sweet España, Spain, well, we have the famous one called El Tango, or Tango, right? Then, which probably... small I can my eyes don't <laughs> quite make it but Jose, um, what were, Jose what was that piece it's so beautiful tango tango it's a tango by who again Albeniz Albeniz okay yes that's one of the his most famous work and uh, now notice the very important things here in this little piece you have the rhythm in the left hand let me see if I can uh, well, this. Well, that's definitely a tango rhythm. But then he started. a tango that's a habanera you see for example if i, I uh, what the famous habanera from uh, That's already habanera. So the tango and the habanera sort of have uh, lots of things in common. And tango was originated in Argentina, but it filtered immediately to Spain. It became not only Spain, uh, in all Europe it became very popular. And the habanera also was obviously Carmen Bisset wrote it in his famous opera, was a popularized dance that uh, in Spain was uh, they adopted as, as their own, even though it was from Cuba. Uh, and this happens, by the way, I have to tell you, when you play a saraband by Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, they, they will tell you that in schools that this is a Spanish dance, right? It was, because it was popular in Spanish, but it was not Spanish. It started in Mexico. So what Mr. Bach wrote, it was really a Mexican that the Spanish had, you know, adopted and make it a, a... So there are many, many interesting things like that happening. So that's from one of them. And of course, it takes a little bit of sophistication, but it's a wonderful piece to, you know, to study. 
Now, the other one is another one which is also in a fusion of uh, um, Jota and uh, uh, Sevillana, and that's called Malagueña. And as I, you see, they're kind of simple. <laughs> See, that's the rhythm of the, like, like list, you know, uh, the, the, the hota. And then he goes uh, to do. Then he brings that left hand which is more of a flamenco left hand, you see? So, and the whole piece is very light. He has that. Then he has... Uh, you notice that in Spanish music, there are a lot of unisons. Uh, the, uh, and this also has to do with the flamenco uh, styles. Uh, and then he has another right. Now the middle section is what we call a cante hondo. Very simple. One, two, three. this cadenza he goes da capo so in a very simple way he gives you his whole compositional style in the, in the big iberia suite you have places in albaicin that ha you have the which is in, in the modal scale of the Phrygian mode. Um, so, but with pieces like that that are totally made for students, you can find already this uh, what do you call it? This this the germs of this. Compositional yeah. Vivian, you want to say something? No, I was just going to say that like this music is so beautiful to me. And yeah. is it found? Can we find it all on IMSLP? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, this and is... Aphrodite is also showing us. Oh, there she is. Aphrodite has it. Yes. That's Very Spain. Good. Yeah, Aphrodite. it has both of uh, them. Uh, the Iberian, it has the Spaniard too, so it's both yes, selections. Yes, exactly, exactly. What edition is that, Aphrodite? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Let me check okay, and I will try it in the chat. I think it's Dover. Yeah. No? I thought so, I thought so, because I cannot, you know, I, th I think so too. Yeah, I think it's the yeah. Dover edition. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. and now you have a, something totally different. The Catalan music, they're very, very simple in binary, simple form, but very different. Um, the Capriccio Catalan in the same suite. A 
etc. So that gives you a, a contrast, contrast totally different to the flamenco style. Um, oh, Excuse and me, one, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Dr. Santana, before you move on, I wanted to ask you, what did you say about the Malguena, that the middle section, how is it called? Oh, Cante, C-A-N-T-E, Hondo, H-O-N-D-O. Thank you. Now, the Cante Hondo is the gypsy chant, you know. Uh, the gypsies always had this kind of... Um, outcry for their passions their mysteries their you know they they, they brood in that you know and uh, you find it in list you know in his uh Ram hungarian rhapsodies the <laughs> from number six you see now in spain they turn it into this type of uh Cante means from the deep of your soul. Hmm? Cante hondo. The hondo means from the depth of your soul. And um, if you listen to uh, the, their uh, recordings, gypsy flamenco music, they have this... This is cante hondo, you see? And this is what Mr. Albenis was inserting in those as middle, as the B section of the piece. Now you have something completely different in a very complicated rhythm, which is not the rhythm that we feel. You know, we feel in 4-4, in four, four, we feel in 3-4, but we, in the Western Hemisphere, we don't really feel in 5-8. And this is a piece called Thorcico, it's spelled Z like zebra, O, R, T like Thomas, Z like zebra, I, C, O. And this is from the Basque country. So the rhythm is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one. Two. That's the Basque rhythm of Exorcico. See, these are simple pieces that are wonderful to give to students and, and that uh, sort of uh, early advance or late intermediate, and it will really bring out their palette of colors and rhythm and very, very very beneficial and, and different uh, that we don't hear. So like that, he wrote Cantos de España, he wrote Suite Español, uh, the famous one, the... That's a seguidilla. You have another one. The middle movement. So you see, 
that he alternates major, minor, then he has the, uh, the, uh, the, then major, augmented, to give that flavor of modality, and back to major. So those are the most popular ones. And again, uh, early advance would be very, very good. Um, and then also the Cadiz. Which is again, kind of a Habanera rhythm. So the, the, Spain has gathered all these fusions of, from Latin America. And oh, the, the other um, composer that I want to touch is, of course, Enrique Granados. They were born more or less at the same time. Now, uh, Enrique Granados um, had a, more of a career of a pianist in terms of the, he didn't write opera. I and mean, he wrote only one opera, Goyescas which became very famous. And now we have this wonderful suite at La Iberia, the counterpart of, of in, in, uh, based on the opera. But besides that, he concentrated on piano, but he was also most interested in teaching piano. He was a pedagogue. So Enrique brought, a, started a conservatory in Barcelona called the Academia Enrique Granados. And he taught Frank Marshall, which was the uh, teacher of Alicia de la Rocha. So Alicia comes exactly from that line, lineage. Now, um, Mr. Granados was a great pianist, uh, improviser, as I said before, and um, he, he studied in, uh, in Paris. He was there, he studied with the people of Chopin, and uh, then he went back to, he didn't stay there long, went back to Barcelona, founded the Academy. Uh, when he finally wrote that opera, Goyescas, uh, he had uh, the great honor that the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City would premiere it. So he and his wife came uh, in a sh big ship, you know, to New America, to New York, and they witnessed the premiere at the Metropolitan Opera House. Goyescas was such a success that President Wilson here in Washington heard about it. And um, this is when classical music used to count here. <laughs> so he invited him to the White House and he and his wife came and had dinner, but they had to postpone their going back to Spain one week because of the invitation of the president. Uh, unfortunately, don't forget, this was the middle of the First World War. So when they get, came back a, a week later, uh, the ship was torpedoed uh, by the Germans. And he died almost as he just was approaching the town of Liverpool in England. He, he the, the story goes that he, his, he knew how to swim, but his wife didn't, and she was drowning. So he jumped to try to save her, and they both drowned. So there was a very tragic ending to this story, but uh, the Academia Mar be uh, Granados became the Academy Academia Marshall that still exists, and of course, Alicia de la Rocha was the great uh, exponent. Uh, the story of, of Mr. Granados, uh, he wrote, um, a lot of salon pieces a la Chopin, but he also wrote uh, uh, Danzas Españolas, which are Spanish dances. If you study his style, it's very different in a way from Albéniz. He doesn't go into the uh, flamenco gypsy core. He stays sort of on the classical Scarlatti uh, type of uh, old Spanish style. So his Spanish dances, I don't have them with me, but they are called Minueto, the first one, Oriental, uh, which probably you know. Yeah, 
and then of course the other one is Andalusa. the most famous ones that uh, and again they're pieces that are very accessible uh, they're wonderful encore pieces and students can learn a lot from them but you see Sarabanda you see Rondaya Valenciana Sardinia Romantica Bolero so all these titles of the Spanish dances belong to the uh, 18th century it was more of a classicist so those are the two main instrument, uh, instrumental composer in Spain. Then you have people like Manuel de Falla, and I think we have a, a video of Alicia de la Rocha playing the last one of his four pieces. Right, and I see Adam has a question. Yeah. Um, aren't Chacones, Chacone, I don't know how to pronounce it, aren't those also Spanish? Chacona, La Chacona, yes. La Chacona is also uh, of a Spanish origin. Uh, it, that means like a figure base that is obsessive. It's based on that, you know, and you buy. And the Fandango is also, you know, a sort of a figure base that is, is obsessive and you write all these uh, variations on top of it. Very good, very good observation. Good question, Adam. Okay, so very I am good. going... Yeah, I'm going to share a screen with a performance um, with Alicia De La Rocha. Let's see. Cante Hondo.
the trans the Cante Hondo but transform in a kind of fantasy world. So this piece, obviously this is a pirate recording in Sydney, Australia. It's not really made professionally, but you could hear it. But the, the interesting thing about this, this piece is it's a very effective piece and it sounds much harder than what it is. It's really not that difficult, uh, but it, it does sound like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's not. Now the other composers, Joaquin Turina, wrote a lot of music for piano. Uh, Ernest, Ernesto Halfter also wrote a very famous uh, piece called Danza de la Pastora. Again, these are more on this particular Danza de la Pastora, the very, uh, uh, it's like a new Scarlatti piece um, uh, in the 20th century with the, the harmonies, but it can be played by an um, advanced intermediate person. Yeah. And then, of course, Joaquin Rodrigo, and Joaquin is the famous one for the Concerto de Aranjuez. So, he also wrote a lot of music for piano. Now we go to Latin America. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is a totally different mm. uh, influence. Of course, the, the, the root is the Spanish or the European, but of course, because of the ethnicities of, of, and the mixture of uh, all this, uh, the Indians from the, the countries, their own countries, plus the, the African slaves um, and the Spaniards. Those three races made a, a big, big, big uh, fusion of style. And now if we start with Cuba, for example, the in 19th century gave us Ignacio Cervantes. Mr. Cervantes is a, uh, was a beautiful pianist, composer. He met Mr. Liszt in Paris. Mr. Liszt heard some of this work. He was fascinated by it. And um, he wrote uh, this vignette called Danzas Cubana, Cuban Dances. And we're going to hear Jorge Luis Prats play some of them.
We better stop here because we want to, yeah. Okay, thanks. To hear this, you hear most of the Caribbean uh, music. It's, it has that flavor. It has the French influence, a habanera rhythm, and the, some of the Spanish habanera too, or tango, and also the African rhythm in it. So that's the fusion. Yes. Oops. And if I just might add, like, it's so interesting. It's so vocalistic, you know, like yes. singing of the piano that's in right. all that's of right. this music. It really strikes me that you have the underlying rhythm. Yes. And then like a mezzo soprano singing above. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So I could exactly. also see how it's a little tricky to try to get a not as advanced pianist to play this music because it's like requires such subtlety. Right. But Although it, maybe it's very it, good practice, right? But it's a very good practice to get them to uh, wake up and expand and express that because, you know, they, we're sometimes so confined to our, you know, so this is... Now, the last one I want to play is by a composer who's alive. His name is Osvaldo Goliov uh, from Argentina. And Mr. Goliath is a very uh, demand, uh, a composer in demand nowadays, one of the great uh, Latin American composers. He composed this piece, Levante. Um, and it's really based on, I guess, salsa rhythm. And it's really a very fascinating piece. Uh, Mr. Who's the, who we have? Yeah. Horacio Lavandera. Mr. Goliath uh, lives in. Massachusetts.
So yeah, that is a far cry from where we started, but this is fascinating to see how this music has traveled and, uh, and reached and in, in every ethnic mu uh, group has contributed to in the language of classical music. And uh, it's fascinating. Of course, I didn't want to say about Ginastera and Villalobos because you all know them. And they also have their, their uh, folkloric, but these are uh, vibrant uh, composers that you are not so familiar with. And I think they're fascinating. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Santana. This was so amazing. I learned so much today. Thank you. Really, I just want to, you know, open up the floor to all of you. If anybody has any questions that you, you'd like to ask. Yes. So, um, I loved it. Thank you so much. It's very interesting because Thank I'm you. from Greece and I do the same research for the yes. Greek music, which is very common because of the folklore elements. Right. But you know i have given a lot of spanish music i think students uh, love it and they can do amazing in competitions in festivals because it's like so vibrant as you said yes and that's exactly the color that is missing sometimes from a very standard repertoire right um, right but i have noticed something uh dr sandan and i wanted your advice i find that sometimes the rhythms are hard for the children and it yes. takes them a little bit of time right. to understand the feeling. And okay, for me, this music is easier than the classical period because it's more incorporated right. in my tradition. But for yeah. the more westernized education, is it harder to take the students to understand this pattern. So how do you teach right. it? Well, they have to have already developed a certain amount of musicianship and pianistic skills to try to tackle this because of that what you just mentioned um the easiest ones are not so taxing technically but yes the the, the idea is to get them to expand the rhythmic uh, scope and the rhythmic that's that's one of the purpose why I think it's a good a good way of expanding them because the the music is so rich and so creative. It's not see for example uh, the music of Bella Bartok as much as great as he is is I've always find it a little bit hard for children because there's no there's something that they don't uh, missing not not that it's not missing it's just that it's harder for them to grasp. But this is music that is a little bit more closer to the human core, you know, and the emotional response. And I think if you, if, if you teach this music, uh, whenever you have, you know what, it's very good that you brought this up because this music tell, uh, discipline us to really play in time count count very cool and do a real rubato within a rhythmic structure which you can then apply to chopin schumann and things like that you see that's why it's so fascinating um to to study that because when people think spanish music of course when we hear great masters like Jorge Luis Prats and Alicia de la Rocha and people like that, they can stretch a phrase and make it. But this is, I mean, very few people can do that, <laughs> you know, at that level. So the artistry, but but the the I think idea of stretching their imagination, their sense of timing. Uh, and rubato and teaching them what a rubato should be it's very much there in this in this music so then you can apply to others because i find sometimes you know i mean i've been listening to a lot of pianists lately the the, the competition in most uh, chopin in warsaw and i'm amazed you know when they go the 
the song for? <laughs> There's a space there, they don't see it, you see? This music is full of these little things, you know? <laughs> that they can apply. And these are, I'm talking about already people who are in international competition and the counting is wrong. <laughs> so perhaps this music will teach us all to breathe a little better. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I know in my childhood, it really gave me a very uh, solid rhythmic foundation because I was forced to count, you know? And if it doesn't, work if it doesn't if you don't count it it doesn't quite work in Japan you, yeah, you, you hear it soft and you your ear is sort of distorts it but here it's it's you don't have that accessibility so you really have to be very careful what you do and that's why it's uh, you can look at it from that angle also I have a question I yes. was wondering if there's some way that you could get a list to us of or yes. well, late intermediate pieces yes. that we can give. Yes. Just because I yes. don't, some of the names are hard for me and I don't know if I'd remember them, but I would of love course, course. those yeah, ideas. Yeah, yeah. I'll pass it to Dr. Vivian Cheng and she can share it with you. That would be mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Santana, thank you so much for coming today. I. That's great. I saw, Zach, that you also have that request. I do have all of your emails, and so I will be in touch and with a repertoire list. And yes. of course, as Dr. Santana goes off to Hart School of Music in Connecticut, we wish you all the best, and we hope Thank to have you, you come back and speak with oh, us. I know this was Anytime. absolutely so informative and i could have personally sat there and listened to you play all afternoon actually <laughs> i could have just like gorgeous yeah. like next time we'll have to have you come in and just give a concert absolutely yeah love to love to and okay. i can I say one more thing really quickly sure. could you also include um repertoire for for us <laughs> as well some interesting yeah, pieces yeah, yeah. so late intermediate but also advanced because oh I'm yes of course yeah. like some of them so yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you yeah, so yeah. much this was really wonderful mariah is an, mariah is an outstanding day. pianist so that'll yeah. be oh that's great yeah. i love to hear you yeah. Okay. And then one last thing. Next week, we have Dr. Scott Holden coming to speak about memorization. I saw him give this presentation a week ago, two weeks ago, actually, at the Juilliard program. It was absolutely incredible. 10 tips to try to make sure that you really have something memorized. And so really good for student pianists, but also for teachers. I wrote down lots of tips that I'm going to pass along to my own students when I start teaching in earnest in the fall. So please join us and sign up if you're available to come. And we are going to continue adding workshops. So if you feel like there's something that you want that you know we could provide, just let us know because we're just trying to provide, you know, meaningful, interesting content for pianists who are, you know, who want to keep learning. Okay. So be well everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Vivian.